Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Jesus has died, has descended to the dead for a couple days. We don't know, we don't get a lot of information about his whereabouts during that time. But now on the testimony of the women at the grave and even Simon Peter and the disciple Jesus loved, who tradition tells us is John, the grave is now empty and some have seen and believed that Jesus is not there. They don't know where he is, but he is not there. As the disciples return to their homes, it is Mary who stays at the graveside and sees the Lord. To the other, for the others, they are back processing these events. When our reading occurs, it's later that same day and the disciples are behind locked doors. When Jesus suddenly appears, although he could have reprimanded them for their unbelief or for running away from his actual death when he could have used some companionship, or even now for being locked down because of fear, Jesus simply greets them with peace. Peace, not fear, peace, not anxiety, Peace, not guilt. As he breathes this peace on the disciples, he sends them to spread the news, which includes peace and forgiveness. He says, as the Father has sent me, I, so I send you. But where is Thomas? And what is he doing as the disciples gather and are hunkered down together in fear. We hear in all of our lessons today, the believers unite in some way. In Acts, the whole group who believe were of one heart and one soul. In the short verses we heard from Psalm 33 that we sung together, it speaks of how good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. 1 John speaks of that fellowship with the Father, the Son, and with one another. But when we get to the gospel lesson, the disciples, yes, are together. They're behind locked doors, but Thomas is missing. Was Thomas no longer afraid of those who had killed Jesus? Was he busy trying to get on with his life? I have to wonder if he was grieving, grieving disappointment, grieving for trusting that Jesus was the one, feeling like a fool. We aren't told. What we are told earlier in John is when Jesus had wanted to go to Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead, the disciples had warned the people, were had warned that the people were looking to stone him. But it's Thomas, who's wanting to keep the group together. It's Thomas who said, let us go that we may die with him. But not today. Thomas is nowhere to be found. So the first person the disciples have to go tell is Thomas. We have seen the Lord, Thomas, Jesus is alive. We weren't wrong. We have to get the band back together. There's work to be done, and people need to know this. Now, we know the story of Thomas, or at least we think we do. He gets a bad rap for his doubting and his needing proof. Yet, in actuality, when Thomas does see Jesus, He's the first to say to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Not bad for a doubter. 
So with Thomas back on board, the work begins and there won't be time to sort out all the creeds right now. That's going to take another 300 years or so when they actually are in a time of peace. But for now, the disciples are in this together and they're sent out by Jesus to spread this news. He is alive and his message is one of peace and it is about forgiveness. David Winter, and I have told this story before and I'm going to tell it again because it's one of my favorites. But David Winter, a priest in the Diocese of the Oxford, wrote a commentary on Handel's Messiah. And in it, he tells of speaking to a church regarding the need for Christians to go public with their faith, to proclaim it from the rooftops, using the words from Handel's oratorio. He says, perhaps I was a bit too enthusiastic because a smartly dressed man sitting in the back remarked that he had always believed his faith was a private matter between him and God. Winter agreed that of course our faith is private and personal commitment is known only to God. But he continued by saying, it's just as well the apostles hadn't taken the same view because if they had, the Christian faith may have just died out about A.D. 80 when the last of them toppled off their chair in the upper room, wondering if perhaps they should have told somebody that Jesus had risen from the dead. By the time of the stories in Acts and 1 John, the faith of the disciples has gone public, and we hear how they're taking their turn to tell the story to the next generation. But according to John, that is not how the message got started. It got started with questions, with doubts, and with fear. And there's no reason for us to believe that we won't encounter folks who have the same doubts, the same questions, and the same fears when we try to tell them about our faith and especially about our resurrected Jesus. And this is where we pause. It isn't about us. The doors of people's hearts are sometimes locked, and only Jesus can walk through them. If we're honest, we waffle in our own faith and our beliefs and the details of the story. And when we don't know what to say, as Philip, the rector, <laughs> reminded us last week, the only six words we really need are, the Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. And yet, and, because we live in that broken world, a world that doesn't understand our Christian lingo, <clears throat> and a world that we are wise not to forget how much God loves. It helps when we share Jesus' message of peace and when we are the leaders ourselves of forgiveness. He sent Jesus into the world so that you and I and even the thems out there can live. The Creator Himself came to heal and restore his world. And the crazy part of it all is that God has chosen us to be the ones to tell it in all of our anxiety and all our fears and all our doubts, to go tell someone that Jesus has risen and that and his message goes in peace and forgiveness. Jesus is alive. Go in peace, my friends, and forgive as you have been forgiven. Amen.